welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm Ian. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to talk about the Rob Zombie Halloween remake from 2007 and Halloween 2, also from Rob Zombie, which came out in 2009. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis for Rob Zombie's Halloween remake? Well, for me, this film is uh, a film of two parts. The first part follows a 10-year-old Michael Myers, who is being raised in probably the worst redneck family ever. Um, He's obviously having mental uh, issues and brutally kills his sister, uh, her boyfriend and his father. He's institutionalized and looked after by Dr. Sam Loomis, played by Malcolm McDowell. 15 years later, Michael has grown into a behemoth and escapes from the institution to hunt down his baby sister. This is from director Rob Zombie, who is already an established musician. I actually like all of his work. I even like his music videos. Mm. He's most well known for The House of a Thousand Corpses, which when it came out was paid very much homage to the grindhouse, schlocky, slasher horror genre. Yeah. It was over the top, gratuitous, violent, brutal and very memorable. Yeah. It almost seemed like a music video in itself. Of course, he followed that up with a spectacularly The Devil's Rejects, which is a gripping, yeah. tense roller coaster ride where you're sympathetic to these serial killers. It's, it's hard to pull off, and he did that fantastically. Yeah. So when I heard that he was going to make a studio movie, alarm bells started going off straight away. Any well established independent director that then all of a sudden starts working for a studio, those projects usually fall apart. They just never deliver what that creative um, genius, if you will, is able to deliver. And so watching this film, I was was torn between wanting to watch this as a Halloween film and also wanting to see Rob Zombie uh, insert his sort of slant into filmmaking. And what we're seeing here is pretty much a blend of both. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a big Rob Zombie fan. House of a Thousand Corpses was just groundbreaking when it first came out. You know, people were like, oh my God, it's so horrendous. And I'm like, finally, a good horror movie. Devil's Rejects, even more brilliant with its twist ending at the end. It's just another phenomenal film. So when they said they were remaking Halloween, I was like, oh my God. And then they sugarcoated it by saying, we're giving it to Rob Zombie. And I was like, fucking A. There is no way Rob Zombie can mess this film up. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be violent. It's going to be bloody. It's going to be gory. And for a bonus, we get Michael Myers. For This was one of the first films, I think, to come out before the remakes of Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street. And those films, it's a weird kind of pattern, obviously. Halloween had paved the way for Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street. Then they had completely burnt everything out of us by saying that, you know, everything we do is cliche anyway. And then they came back for a remake. And Halloween, for me, just smashed the door open and was like, Hi, I'm back! And you're like, <laughs> fucking yeah. The whole first 40 minutes. Well, this is the most interesting part, is because there's a huge gap, obviously, in the first Halloween movie between... Yeah between Michael killing his sister to him coming back to Haddonfield. And this sort of works as a quasi-prequel, yes. if you will, yes. because we really get to see what Michael was like when he was interacting with his family or when he was in a school environment. Some of them are a little bit tropey, yeah, but yeah. we genuinely get to see where this character's origin is, and it's far more interesting than any of the other schlocky stuff they came up with in the latter Halloween movies. Yeah. It does very much pay homage to the first movie where, again, we're seeing him bullied in school and there's a lot of throwbacks to the original movie. But what is the big departure from the original is the fact that this is a severely dysfunctional family. Yeah. They curse at each other. They they sort of hate each other in, in that sort of family way. Yeah. And Michael is sort of... He seems on the surface to be unaffected by it. But deep down, as a, as a viewer, you're kind of sympathetic with him because of this sort of harsh world that he's growing up in. Take that damn thing off. You are starting to annoy me, boy. I hate you. And I hate you, too. You see this? 
as soon as he heals, I'm gonna break it again on your fucking face! Enough, all right? So I like the idea of the whole nature versus nurture argument, but it just seems a bit too simplified and dumb yeah. in a Halloween movie, because we all know that Michael Myers is a troubled individual before any sort of supernatural elements get involved in the story. Yeah, yeah. So it just kind of, it just kind of offsets the film. But the great thing about this remake is that we get to see a prolonged period of time of Michael in Smith's Grove Sanitarium yeah. with Dr. Loomis. And we really get to see how that sort of relationship sort of uh, evolved over those 15 years to the point where Loomis is then no longer his yeah. doctor. I thought that that actually works really well in conjunction with the other two Halloween movies. Yeah, I mean, obviously this this whole opening, we just see the deterioration of Michael, basically. You, you, you watch him just, you know, slowly become more and more of this mass psychopathic killer that we obviously recognise. Um, but I, I love the, the the child actor. He, his just his just presence on screen every now and again. You know, I, I kind of think, oh yeah, he's just a child actor, and then he goes all quiet, or he does the look, and he puts the mask on, and I'm like, no, he's not. He's the fucking child version of Michael Myers, and he's going to brutally kill you as soon as he gets the chance. Well, the film kind of reminds you of that every instance it gets by just playing the Halloween score from John Carpenter. Yeah. I will say that they overuse the score in this film because they play it when it's not really necessary or poignant. It just kind of feels a bit like filler because yeah. they just didn't know. They just wanted to go, yeah, he's Michael Myers. He's the killer. You remember Keep because you can us, hear the you music. <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing. I mean, barring the, the brutal killings that Michael does. And like the bully where he gets revenge against yeah. him where he hides out in the woods. This, this film is this film is stamped with Rob Zombie's press. You know, if you've never seen a Rob Zombie film or have never seen any of his videos, you are not going to like the Halloween mo the his Halloween movies because they are overly over the top brutal violence there's lots of swearing obscenity uh, nudity yeah and brutality in in the violence but i feel that's that that's just an extension of what we've already seen before what we've kind of grown up with with the last eight movies is that you know it it the, the films have always had violence blood sex swearing and drugs in but now we're in the 2000s we can just push it up to 11 if we want to i found it quite difficult to enjoy malcolm mcdowell as loomis and i'll explain to you why later on but at the at the first, when you first see him, he's kind of like a hippie. You know, he's like a free spirit. He's turning up at Smith's Grove and he's like, oh, I can save everybody. You know, it's it's good times, man. It's all high, you know. And then you then hear his reports, quick montages of his reports of Michael's deterioration. And you just start to hear Dr. Loomis kind of go back on his on himself like, there's no saving him. This boy has no idea what he did, but is ready to do it again. Michael's so-called normal moments are becoming fewer and fewer, and I'm particularly worried about this. I believe it's these masks have begun to create a mental sanctuary in which Michael can hide within himself and from himself. And I, I, I kind of like that, but at the same time, I'm just like, I just want to get to the killing now. You know, I don't. I don't want to know what makes Michael this do this anymore. I know what Michael. What makes Michael do this? I've seen him do it. You know, <laughs> so that sort of brings us to the sort of midpoint of the film, near enough where Michael has proven that he's not going to recover, and his killing tendencies are still there. Yeah, which leads into a really dramatic scene where Michael Myers' mother can no longer deal with the fact that most of her family is dead. Yeah. And she she brings a gun to herself while she's watching home videos of yeah. her with her son. And it's a really sad moment. I kind of feel like 
I, I do want to hate her for abandoning her other daughter because that is really, it's, it's, yeah, I, I find that hard to swallow. Yeah. But at the same time, it's still a very poignant scene because it does then show how abandoned uh, Michael is, but also it just leaves this other child so vulnerable, as we know, that there is the brother-sister relationship straight off the get-go in this film instead yeah. of it being drawn over two movies like the previous one. So, as we know with the Halloween movie, Michael Myers is not going to spend the whole movie in the psychiatric ward. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's going to escape 15 years later and go on a murderous killing spree, leading him all the way back to Haddonfield, where, of course, he's going to chase down his sister. We do have a lot, and I do mean a lot, of cameo appearances in this yeah. film. First up, we have the lovely Danielle Harris. <laughs> yeah. Now, you might recognize her or not from Halloween 4 and 5, where she played Jamie Lee Curtis's daughter, Jamie where in this movie, she's playing one of Laurie's friends instead. Yeah. So it was always good to see her come back into the Halloween franchise, considering she was unduly written out. We also have one of my favourite screen icons, Brad Duroff, yeah. who is just the legendary voice of Charles Lee Ray, another psychotic serial killer <laughs> that likes to possess children and dolls. <laughs> We also have Sid Haig, who comes from a wealth of exploitation slasher horror movies. Yeah. And he only has a small role in this, but it's still great to see him, especially after seeing him in other Rob Zombie movies. Yeah. We also have Danny Trejo, who I will always refer to as Machete. Machete. <laughs> he has some fantastic scenes in this film where he's sort of the nurse for Michael Myers who sort of looks after him the entire time he's in the hospital and he has some great scenes opposite Michael especially when Michael's on his birth of his killing spree yeah we also have Ken Forhey <laughs> yeah. who is from one of my favorite zombie movies of all time Dawn of the Dead so it's always great to see him still working in horror see I also want to bring up as well Mikey DeLonge from the monkeys <laughs> plays the gunsmith and all these little pop-ups of characters if you're a horror fan each it's one... like christmas yeah, instead. It's, yeah it's like they're all waving to you like hey we're here as well and you're like yes another <laughs> bunch of padding for the halloween movie and it's done by rob zombie yes it's just little parts i mean you know we have obviously like i said we've had danny Trejo playing the nurse looking after michael and when he comes across the the fucking destruction that michael has caused i I don't want to say caused actually. He, um, Michael, Michael's door is left open. Two fucking stupid security guards decide to go into his room and rape a girl in front of him. None of this affects Michael. It only affects him when they start messing around with his masks. And so he goes, he, he kills them brutally. And then his, he realizes his door's open, so he can just walk out. And I'm like, but that, 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 that's who to blame for this film. You know, you, all these people who get killed is because of those two fucking security guards. And then Danny Trejo turns up, and you've already, been, you've already seen Danny Trejo talking to Michael at a young age, and he's really nice and friendly. And you obviously realize that their relationship, they've got this nice thing going on where Michael's not going to cause any trouble, and Danny's going to look after him. But then when fucking... Spoilers, when Danny Trejo is getting killed and he's like, I, I helped you, I helped you. I'm like, nobody's fucking safe in this film. Nobody. Even if you try your best to be Michael's friend, he's going to brutally kill you the first chance he gets. I was going to you, Mikey. I was I, I really like the scene with Ken Forhey in the yeah. in the toilet cubicle where he's just like, you do not know who you're fucking with. And I'm <laughs> yeah. like, no, actually, this is going to be a good stand-up fight because these are big guys. And it is actually 
a particularly brutal bathroom sort of brawl. Yeah. Where he continues to smack his hand against the side to try and get him to drop the knife. And they literally destroy that cubicle. Yeah. And that's just an insight into the brutality of the of the fighting in this. It does actually feel very naturalistic and real. Yeah. Despite it being exaggerated. Yeah. I Like we said, we haven't even got Michael back to Haddonfield yet. In the first film, he'd... He'd killed his sister, and he'd killed like a guy in a car, and then got back to Haddonfield and obviously killed the babysitters. Michael at this point has killed his sister, his dad, his, his stepdad, si- uh, his stepdad, his sister's boyfriend, a nurse played by Sybil Danning. Then he's gone and killed like five or six other nurses fifteen years later. So we're already at like eleven or twelve kills before he's killed Ken Forey. Now we're on 13, and he's not even back in Haddonfield yet. And I'm, I'm fucking loving this ride. I am just going with it. I'm just like, it's everything everything I want from a remake of the first one, plus extra. But this is when that car ride turns into a car wreck. <laughs> because now that we're leaving prequel territory, and now strongly heading into John Carpenter's Halloween remake territory... Yeah. Unfortunately, Rob Zombie takes the whole two hours of the original Halloween and condenses all of that down into 30 minutes. There is not enough time here to build tension or suspense or to make you care for these other teenagers, which we know now are just going to be fodder for Michael Myers. It doesn't matter who they're being played by. Yeah. So Michael turns up and he... You know, he's hiding behind trees, behind cars. He's looking through the windows. He's doing yeah. all of the things that we remember him doing in all of the other Halloween movies. And it just gets into that formulaic remake shot for shot territory where it just starts to get boring because you no longer have that investment to the characters because we have shifted time scales so much yeah. that introducing these characters this late into the film, it just has a huge disconnect for me. See, you see, for me, I already knew, you know, at being a remake, I already knew that those teens were going to die. So I was he- hella prepared before the credits had even started. So when he does return to Haddonfield, I just love the imagery. The imagery of this giant figure wearing the Michael Myers mask that he finds he finds underneath his house. You know, a lot of people have questioned this on the internet. Like, oh, he had time to bury that. It's like, well, yeah, he did. He killed his family. And then he must have buried his stuff and then sat outside with his baby. So that's kind of all explained. But I I get kind of confused of... So that mask looks like the original mask. So is it based on a William Shatner painted face? They have William Shatner in this universe? Or is it based on a Michael Myers mask because they have their own type of Halloween in this universe? It's like... But... It, going back, it's for me, the imagery of him in the boiler suit with the big knife... And the mask. You know, the first time I'd seen... The best time I'd ever seen it was in the 1978 movie. You know, seeing it almost 20 years on. Exactly the same, but then at the same time with its own modern day twist was nice. Yeah, because the mask looked deteriorated and worn and yeah. haggard. Almost like as if that mask had been through. Had been all, through all, all the All of the eight yeah. movies at this point. <laughs> the thing for me, though, is that too much of the mystery surrounding Michael is removed from this film because it tries to explain, you know, everything yeah, about him. Yeah. So it doesn't leave too much to the imagination. And for me, that's, again, another lackluster appeal of the film. It is, for me, though, a modern, trashy, grindhouse movie. It it doesn't do anything new or exciting after the halfway point, And it just plays out almost like every other traditional slasher movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My favorite scene in the film comes again at that transition point from uh from the point where he's in the hospital to before his killing spree yeah and that is where he's his mother's come to visit him perhaps for the last time and dr loomis is escorting her out and michael sat there with the nurse and the nurse is just unfazed and unbothered because at this point michael's not said anything for days and then michael grabs a knife and he kills the gloriously beautiful Sybil Danning, who you might remember from films like Howling 2. <laughs> and uh, 
I like the way that it's filmed and edited because it goes into sort of slow motion. Yeah. Uh, we don't we don't hear all their voices or the sort of echoed and it sort of blends into the music score. And for me, that was a really emotional turning point for the mother, for Dr. Loomis as well, when they've realized that all of these efforts are in vain yeah. and this is the result. For me, that, that there was a fantastic scene. It encapsulated everything that the first sort of 30, 40 minutes had built up to in preparation for what was to come. Unfortunately, the rest just couldn't quite live up to, to that crescendo moment for me. My favorite scene, I'm a bit, I'm a big fan of this film, um, even though it is a remake. It has everything, everything I want to see as in a remake of the first Halloween movie, plus a little bit more. But then at the same time, like I said, a bit of a modern twist. The jokes are stupid. The gore is over the top. It's just, it's just fun. Like I said, my favorite scene is where Dr. Loomis has gone to see Brad Dourif and he's trying to explain to him, much like uh, Donald Pleasance had in the first one, tries to explain to him what Michael Myers is. And um, Brad Dourif kind of looks at him and says, you know, what can we expect? And Dr. Loomis just looks at, looks back at him and says, I don't know, Sheriff, but it's not good. And I'm like, really? <laughs> Massive understatement, but oh, okay then. <laughs> I do sometimes think whether Rob Zombie can really write a genuine screenplay, because so much of the dialogue does seem slightly hackneyed. I think the best bits of dialogue in this film are the dialogue that he's ripped straight from the original movie <laughs> and just refed Dr. Loomis those lines. I, I sort of half-heartedly recommend this movie, I very rarely recommend any remakes or reboots yeah. as it is. I will always say, watch the original, uh, because it's usually that much better. But as I have said, the ha the original Halloween movie is 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 getting dated now, and it does show. But when you rewatch these remakes and the latter sequels, it just makes you still appreciate that first film so much more. Yeah. And it's almost like this film is also just worshipping the original Halloween movie by the amounts of references and nods to it. You could only really appreciate this film as a fan of the entire Halloween franchise. If you're, if you're a fan of Rob Zombie movies, you'll also get a good kick out of this. If yeah. you're a fan of horror movies in general, you'll get a kick out of seeing all of these familiar horror icons all in one movie. If you're outside of that field of, of movie going, avoid Halloween. There's not much here for you except explicit nudity gore and violence and if you, if that is not your thing you don't you already know to stay away from this film i like gary i, I do and i don't recommend this movie i i do recommend the first 38 40 minutes of it um to, for a build up towards the original film you know if, if you're going to sit down and watch the original film maybe cr crack in the first 40 minutes of the remake and then go back and watch the original if, if you are a massive fan, then yeah, you've probably sat through all the other Halloween movies as well. You're getting to the remake. You're just wanting to see, you know what's going to happen. You would just want to see more blood guts and tits. Um, but yeah, if, if you're not into violence, swearing, nudity, drugs, blood, guts, and, you know, serial killers, don't watch this film. Which brings us on to Halloween 2, which came out just two years later. Ian, wouldn't you give us the synopsis for Halloween 2? Well, at the end of Halloween, uh, Laurie has shot Michael in the face. She's found wandering the streets and taken to a hospital uh, where Michael appears and brutally starts killing all the nurses. Uh, don't worry, it's a dream. <sighs> two years later... After that fateful Halloween night, Michael is returning to Haddonfield to finish off what he started with his sister. If I may. What the fuck, Rob Zombie? What the fuck? I really fucking enjoyed the remake Halloween. And then you come across with this. This film makes no... No, it makes sense on a borderline level. 
Rob Zombie was told by the producers to make a sequel and that he didn't have to stick with any of the rules. Any of the rules that had been set by the other fucking eight movies building up to his remake. Instead, it comes along and starts with Michael walking down the street seeing his dead mother's ghost with a white horse. Now, the white horse is explained at the beginning as a symbol of purity and rage. So, in essence, pure rage. And then Michael wanders. He becomes a nomad. Basically, just walking the countryside of Haddonfield. I, as soon as I heard that Rob Zombie was going to make a sequel to his remake, I was like, I, I wanted to call him a sellout for continuing to work in a studio environment instead of going off and making his own thing. Obviously being told that he was given a uh, creative license to, to take the franchise in any direction that he wished. I was like, well, at least that gives him some leniency to, to do that. Yeah. However, I just don't think that when he's telling of, or trying to, to tell a traditional story, he has any sort of boundaries as to how to, how to make it work. Yeah. His films work when the characters are all batshit crazy because of the unpredictable nature of, of those characters. Where in this film, he's trying to uh, incorporate what he had established into the first one, into the second one, and show the deterioration of the characters that had survived it. Yeah. And it's sort of, we get introduced to Margaret Kidder's character, who is Laurie's um, psychiatrist, and they try and explore how damaged she is yeah but it just it's just frustrating because every scene is filled with just vulgar profanity for profanity's sake a lot of the script is just overusing swearing and sort of it's a way it's the only way the characters seem to be able to express themselves in this film and it's just really jarring and uncomfortable to watch because for a lot of the time i have no idea what the character of Laurie is even saying. I was frustrated with the opening of the movie because we see her, it takes place instantly after the first film, which I, yeah. I liked. Where we see her in the hospital, we see her getting all of her injuries patched up, and I'm like, okay, this is quite tense. This reminds me of Halloween 2. Yeah. Michael Myers turns up, starts killing people off, and she gets chased down into the, into the car park. She hides in the security office with the really nice security officer. Michael turns up and starts killing, killing him off and is chasing her. All the while, we've got the Moody Blues Nights in White Satin playing in the background for like 15 minutes. It's one hell of a long song. There's also a sequence where she falls into a chute filled with bodies. And I was like, well, I'm, I was trying to imagine that Michael Myers has perhaps killed everyone in the hospital <laughs> and forced them all down the laundry chute. <laughs> of course, if you're wise enough, you would have already gathered that this perhaps isn't a reality anymore. And you're fucking right. It's a dream sequence. A 15 minute long dream sequence because that's what this movie needed was more fucking padding. It was so frustrating to just be teased like that because the film then picks up two years later. I fucking hated the way they portrayed Laurie in this film. She, she, so, so after the killings and she spent this time trying to rebuild her life, obviously, yes... I know it's demoralizing that your parents have been brutally murdered and obviously, you know, your friends have obviously been attacked. Um, you're still living in the town that this all happened. So obviously that's going to cause problems for you. And obviously without actually trying to get over it, she decides to become an anarchist and is wanting to just worship at the feet of people like Charles Manson and, you know, rebel against all kinds of nature because she led a good life and this happened to her so now she's going to lead a bad life and that's going to make things better i'm like what the fucking hell you know you've you've basically they don't even get and now i'm going to come to my dr loomis bit as well because at the same time two of the most focal characters in the halloween series right are 
fucking just idiotic in Halloween 2. Dr. Loomis, played by the fucking amazing Donald Pleasance and replayed by Malcolm McDowell, is a dick in Halloween 2. He's a fucking dick. He was a dick in the first one, but he was trying to kind of establish a life after Michael Myers. You know, he was releasing books explaining what he'd done for the last 15 years, trying to coax this boy out of his shell. Then obviously all the murders happen. And so what does he do? I'm going to write more books and I'm going to cash in, cash in on my success of being Michael Myers' doctor after Michael Myers has gone on a massive bloody spree. In the original movies, or especially in The Curse of Michael Myers, um, Dr. Loomis has pretty much wrote a book on his memoirs of yes. Michael Myers. Oh, yeah, okay. But it's not something he's doing to cash in. He doesn't want to become a celebrity about it. He's yeah. literally making this as a doctor's journal to help explain to other people in case anything like this would ever happen yes. again. He was doing it for the betterment of, of other people. This Dr. Loomis is a selfish, arrogant, ignorant fucking pig. He has zero traits with the Dr. Loomis that we've all come to know and love. The hero of the The hero of the, of, the, of, the, of the Halloween franchise has been boiled down to this. And it is offensive. It is, it is infuriating to watch all of his scenes where he's just shouting at his lackeys and ordering people around and getting infuriated with, with whoever is, you know, not taking him seriously. It is, it is, it's... It's torturous to get through. I mean, this is old Loomis. This is new. Look, old Loomis increased the sales by 25%. Look, okay, so we'll, well just... I'm not going in there until you go get me a cup of PG tips with a splash of milk, and I want it sizzling hot. PG what? Mm. Tea? We don't have time. The only thing that makes me laugh yeah. is the fact that the actor is the one to kill William Shatner in Star Trek Generations, and the fact that Michael Myers has the William Shatner mask. It just kind of makes me laugh every time I see them on screen. <laughs> <laughs> see, that's, but this this is my point. This is the problem you had with previous horror movies, uh, Halloween movies, is we're not supposed to be laughing. We're supposed to be built up through tense and suspense that fucking Michael is still out there and he's still trying to get Laurie. We're f supposed to feel sorry for Laurie. We're supposed to feel fucking safe when Dr. Loomis is around, and we're supposed to be terrified when Michael finally makes his appearance. But no, in this one, we get fucking Laurie running around, you know, just swearing at absolutely everybody. Why? Oh, if you didn't realize at this point, she's the sister of Michael Myers. So obviously, because of the redneck family he had in the first one, she's obviously redneck too. She's living with Brad Dorif and his daughter, who, spoilers, survived the first movie, you know, but she's basically fucking just causing just anarchy in her, in her environment, which is obviously turning everybody away from her. So you're not feeling sorry for her because she is a bitch. You know, she switches from nice Laurie from the first one to complete fucking bitch Laurie in the second one. Dr. Loomis, do we even have to touch that subject again? He's a dick. And then bring it back to Michael. Michael, wandering. Wandering. He fucking just, he's been wandering the outskirts of Haddonfield following the ghost of his dead mother who's constantly telling him that it's soon going to be time. Amazingly, that time happens around October 31st and he returns to Haddonfield to carry on. I, in the first movie, in the first and second movie, what makes the first and second movie so brilliant for me is I try and forget all of the stuff about Laurie. So by the end of Halloween 2, I'm still surprised to find out that Laurie is his sister. And that is why he's chasing her, because he's trying to kill her like he killed his older sister. In the remakes, why? Why is he coming back? Why is he coming back to Haddonfield? He's, How did he survive the gunshot to the head? <laughs> he's, coming back, he's coming back to find Laurie, because his dead mother's telling him, for what? They so, want to bring the family back together? He he was the one who split it up in the first place. <laughs> he fucking... His, his mother. His mother in the first one I felt really sympathetic for because of the way Sherry Moon Zombie, who is a very attractive lady, but not the world's greatest actress. She's really good as a psychotic 
hillbilly type <laughs> character, but I wouldn't exactly put her in th- things like the King's Speech and shit like that. You know, but her performance in Halloween, the remake, was amazing because I really felt like she loved her family, even though they were a com- bunch of complete fucking assholes, and that their deaths really affected her. So that when she was still seeing Michael in the institution, she loved him, but she hated him. Killing herself was a really traumatic experience, right? For the first film and obviously for the daughter. So you're sat there like, oh my God, I really feel for that character. The second one, it's like they're explaining she's the reason Michael did it. (laughs) And I'm like, wow, did you just rip that off the Jason Voorhees fucking almanac? Did you steal that from Alfred Hitchcock's notes for Psycho? Hmm. (laughs) There's a lot of things there's a lot of things that I don't like about this representation of Michael Myers is that he grunts and makes noises when oh. he's stabbing people. Yeah. I'm like we 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 hear him breathing in the in some of the original Halloween movies which yeah. which is fine because it sets sets that up. But when he's grunting and making noises it just it, it, it humanizes him. It just makes him seem like any other Rob Zombie serial killer. We also get to see Michael Myers killing another dog. To be fair, Michael Myers has killed pretty much every pet dog in every other Halloween movie. But in this one, he eats it. Which, it cuts back to Laurie, who at the time is eating a vegetarian pizza and then throws up for the idea of eating meat as we then cut back yeah. to Michael Myers eating the dog. It's just... Is it psychic, sick, psychic connection? The psychic connection. As we all well know from the other Halloween movies, which never happened, <laughs> the, the Myers family have a psychic connection, which blew my fucking mind towards the end of this movie. We... Uh, certain characters can see ghosts and apparitions walking around and talking like one big happy family. It is... It destroys... The entire movie, any sort of excitement or enjoyment you were getting from the film, for me at that point, was completely destroyed. I was already frustrated with Laurie's character. I was gutted with this representation of the Loomis character. I was upset when a certain actress was killed off in this movie. (laughs) And I empathised with Brad Dourif throughout. And I just wanted him to get some fucking revenge and just end this movie. It's just... Uh, this this film, this film cemented for me for all time how amazing the original movies are. You can try and repackage and remake and retell and redo the story of Michael Myers, but it will never be as good as the first two movies. You every time you try and tell the story. It works to a point, and then people just go. I'm going off on my own here, and you you can't you can't keep up with them. There's nothing to keep up with them for if you're just following a quiet homicidal mass killer stalking people. But Michael in this one, he doesn't. He 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 wanders for half the movie, and then when he finally does turn up, he. Just does his usual, stepping out of shadows and just stabbing people. The film is saturated, sa- I will use the word saturated, with just Rob Zombie motifs. You know, all the stuff that made Devil's Rejects really well with the scary situations, but the music being taken, the ambient sound being taken off and the music being overplayed. So all you, all you see is them screaming, you don't hear it. He just uses that in this one as well. And I'm like, well, that's just a rip off. You then... Every now and again, Sherry Moon Zombies fucking stood there all in white. And I'm just like, so she's his hate. She's his rage. She She's real. She's not real. You know, Laurie, I'm just like, Laurie, for fuck's sake, just leave. Just just get out of town. Just leave. He will never catch up with you because he's so slow at walking. <laughs> you know, Loomis. Oh, God, Loomis, you're such a fucking arrogant prick. I'm sorry, Malcolm McDowell. I... I, I know you were just acting, but you just came across as an asshole in this film. And ultimately, <clears throat> what surprised me as well, watching this film, is that it has two endings. I watched this film when it first came out and saw the ending in which 
uh, Michael has taken Laurie back to his shack and Dr. Loomis turns up and Dr. Loomis explains to Laurie that, you know, everything she's seeing is in her head and he's attacked by Michael. Michael is shot and impaled and then Laurie stabs him. And I, I didn't like that ending at the time, but I kind of grew to accept it because, you know, it was, it was done and dusted. Then I saw the alternative ending, and this is actually my favourite scene. The same ending comes up where Loomis has turned up at the shack, and he explains to Laurie that everything she's seeing is in her head. And then Michael throws him out through the wall. He then stabs Dr. Loomis by say, and saying the word die, which is a big no-no. No, no, no. Michael Myers should never speak. Never. Uh, Michael, for God in hell. And then Michael is shot repeatedly. Laurie then exits the shack and picks up Michael's knife and she is gunned down as well. And the reason why this is my favourite scene is that when she hits the floor, Love Hurts, the song, plays over and I shit you not, when I watched this and heard this song, when I saw this ending for the first time, I flashbacked every sequence of Michael Myers in my head. And it made me realize that yes, love hurts. I love the Halloween franchise, but it fucking hurts me too. <laughs> love hurts, love scars, love of wounds and mars. One of the scenes that made me laugh the most was because it was just that ludicrous that it happened <laughs> was that Dr. Loomis is, is wherever he is at this time and he's watching the news report that Michael Myers has taken Laurie hostage and that people have been murdered and killed and that the police are right outside that hut right now. Yeah. It cuts back then to that location and Dr. Loomis comes running out of the woods <laughs> Like, hey, I'm here, I'm here to, to, to save Laurie again. I was like, how? How, how the... D d d <laughs> it's like magic. <laughs> Pure, simple magic. Um, so that was just, it was just, it's just stupid. I mean, you could, that, that's how I feel about this film. But there was, I was frustrated and annoyed with the drawn out nightmare sequences, but I will give the film some credit that there's a scene in a nightmare sequence where there's sort of these bizarre creatures with like pumpkin heads yeah. um, sat at a table with Laurie, uh, Laurie's corpse sort of as the centerpiece. And the, obviously the imagery is just, it's very haunting. It is very much in essence the Halloween theme, not of the movies, but of, yeah. of yeah. actual Halloween. And it cuts to scenes of the woods and it cuts to her in sort of a glass coffin and sort of the jump cuts and the, the rapid edits and the rapid movements, I thought that really actually captured her mental state. Right. And I really enjoyed the imagery as well. I thought it was actually very creative and memorable. And so I would say that that was, even though I hate dream sequences in films, <laughs> it was perhaps my most memorable scene in the film. I do not recommend Halloween 2. Again, this is another blight on the franchise. There are a couple of memorable scenes. There are a few things to get excited for. At least this time, he's pretty much dropped the Halloween theme, right. John Carpenter's yeah. theme from the movie, and, and has his own slant. It is not a tense movie. This is an adrenaline-filled movie, where everything, as you've said, is turned up to 11, and it just loses any sort of impact. This is, again, it's a trashy grindhouse movie where Halloween shouldn't be about that. I... I don't recommend Halloween 2, the remake. I totally recommend Halloween 2, the original, following on from the original film. 
this this remake shouldn't have happened. Sh- shouldn't. Well, Ian, I'm going to throw you a curveball here, but is the Halloween franchise dead and buried? Will it be rebooted again? Will it get another sequel? Will it be a third movie? Will it be another offshoot from the Michael Myers franchise? I feel they should remake Halloween every 10, 20, 30 years. Retell the story that was given to us before. A cold, devastating serial killer hiding behind a mask, stalking babysitters. That's all we want. We just want to see a guy walk around, lifting people up, sticking them to walls. We don't need druids. We don't need magic. We don't need big family oriented stories. We don't need to feel for the characters. We just need to be scared. And that's what Michael Myers really does. And that's all we want from any Halloween movie. We hope you've enjoyed watching our reviews for all 10 Halloween movies. And we hope you have a happy Halloween. Trick or treat, motherfuckers. (laughs) Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews.